Okay, um, so so I don't delay more. I feel my trickle in, but I'm going to, uh, I'm really happy to have Amit Levy here today. He's a PhD candidate um, from Stanford University. Amit works on building secure operating system kernels, web frameworks, with this kind of nice focus on making them programmable and extensible by third party developers. And in the course of his PhD, he's, he's uh, not only done a startup, but also built a, an operating system that has a growing community around it. And I think he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. Thanks, Amit. Thanks, Sid. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. OK, so there are about 20 million programmers in the world today. That's an ever-increasing number. And so that, that's a huge number of sort of talented people that you know, hopefully can improve software and the way that we can use computers and so forth. But you know, unfortunately, their ability to actually extend and improve the systems that they use is, is pretty limited in most cases. So um, for things like operating systems, the sort of most interesting interfaces are reserved for sort of trusted kernel modules or maybe processes with, uh, with special uh, privileges. Uh, a lot of web platforms provide APIs for third-party applications to sort of um, to build on, on top of. But you know, again, many of the core features require privileged access to, uh, to, to user data. Um, and then finally, in this sort of emerging world of the Internet of Things, it's even worse, uh, right? The, typically, only a handful of developers control sort of the entire software stack, not just core features. And so the question that sort of inspires a lot of my work is, you know, what would these developers, these 20 million developers do if they had the same level of access uh, as the people providing the APIs in these systems? So, uh, you know, one of the challenges in, in achieving this sort, of, uh, this sort of goal is that, you know, when you sit down to build a system, you, you, you often face a, a seemingly fundamental trade-off between empowering the third-party developers that might program your system and some notion of security. This could be sort of end user data privacy or, uh, or, uh, or controlling resources and so forth. And you know, so the, the point is not that these systems are not extensible because, I don't know, Mark Zuckerberg is a bad person or something, although. Um, but, uh, right, but that's not the point. The point is that this is sort of a, a, real, a real technical challenge. And so my goal is to design systems that eliminate this trade-off, or at least drastically reduce it. This trade-off between security on the one hand and flexibility or the functionality that, uh, that third-party programmers have. And a, a kind of extra bonus here is that if we manage to do this well, then actually we can build sort of overall more secure system because even the trusted programmers can sort of take code out of the, the trusted computing base and move them into application code or extensions. So even if you don't really care about these 20 million programmers, I think this goal is sort of a, a useful tool anyway. Okay, so there's sort of a standard approach to doing uh, secure systems research. So you know, if we want to solve some 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 problem, we might articulate a threat model that uh, that, that models some uh, some some bug in the real world. Maybe things like like buffer overflows. And so the threat model might be something like the user can give us arbitrary strings or something like that. And then we'll create some security mechanism that addresses that particular threat model. So in this case, maybe something like stack canaries. And then we'll build a system around that uh, mechanism in the threat model and port a bunch of existing applications to this new system. And if we've done, if we've done, if we've done well, then you know, we've successfully reduced the attack surface of the system. Um, and so you know, this approach has been actually pretty reasonably effective in terms of actually improving security for existing systems. But you know, if, our goal, if our goal is sort of unleashing the productivity of these 20 million programmers, then this framework doesn't, doesn't really fit that question. It doesn't really help us answer that question. Uh, because we don't typically evaluate how the changes to, this, to these systems uh, sort of impact the ability of, uh, of developers to, to innovate on the system itself. On the flip side, there's this sort of approach of extensible systems research. And this is sort of subtly different. So here we'll sort of typically first create some fancy new security mechanism and then basically articulate the threat model that's most uh, interesting and most restrictive that this security mechanism can, um, can address. Then we'll design a totally new API and build a system around it. And then you know, hopefully write a bunch of new applications that weren't possible in previous systems. Um, so this is also a really nice approach. And uh, it's been quite successful in terms of, uh, of you know, resulting in research systems that are incredibly extensible and, and in my opinion, quite beautiful. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't seen very sort of widespread adoption of the techniques that this, uh, 
sort of history of research has, uh, has resulted in. And my thesis is that sort of in theory, these systems let anybody extend the system. But in practice, if you're not you know, a computer science PhD student with like a specialization in secure systems, then you're going to have a hard time sort of cracking the code for these particular systems. And so I think it's important that we make sure that it's not only sort of possible in theory uh, to extend systems, but that it's also possible in practice. And the tool that we have for this as system builders is the API. So we need to figure out how to design sort of the right API to make, uh, to make these systems extensible by, you know, by third-party developers. And I think we typically fall short in sort of one of two ways. Uh, we either design APIs that are secure but aren't expressive enough. And so the programmer that is building an application basically can't achieve their goal. On the other hand, we can build systems that are very expressive but brittle or error prone. So you might have to, as a programmer, sort of strew uh, subtle checks all over your code. And if you miss a check somewhere, then you know, your code breaks and you break functionality or you might violate security guarantees. And so I think to get sort of the best of both worlds from, uh, from our APIs, we need to design and come up with novel ways of designing these APIs and novel abstractions. <laughs> and a principle that I've found, at least in my research, to be useful for, uh, for doing this is to sort of get into the developer's head and figure out how to coax the right information uh, out of the developer. Uh, sort of if we can get them to express exactly what they want, no more and no less, then we can both you know, help them achieve their goals and, uh, you know, build a system that actually enforces the policies that we might care about. Um, and I think that the sort of key takeaway or the key, the key bit to keep in mind is that, you know, this sort of goal is really something that we have to evaluate end to end. This is sort of an empirical question of, uh, of, of, of whether we've done this correctly. So that's kind of what I do. Uh, I build systems that try to empower these 20 million programmers without sacrificing the security of the system. And I, I typically use tools from the programming languages world, like type safety or information flow control. And I try to evaluate systems with real developers, with practitioners. You know, and so far, I've done this in a number of settings. As Sid graciously mentioned, I've uh, built sort of distributed storage systems and web application frameworks, uh, low power networking gateways. And most recently, I've been, I've been working on uh, operating system kernels. So today I'll tell you about three of these projects. I'll focus most of my time on this operating system kernel called Talk, and then I'll spend just a little bit of time each on a, um, just describing at a high level two other projects: Hails, a web uh, a web platform, and Beetle, uh, which is a low power networking gateway system. Okay. So uh, so Talk is a secure operating system for microcontrollers that we've been working on for the past three or so years. And I think operating systems are sort of a particularly uh, useful place to sort of explore this question. And the reason is that it sort of embodies both sides of the problem. On the one hand, we typically have sort of device drivers, which are a sort of extension to the, to the kernel that has, in some sense, like lots of power and is very extensible, but is sort of totally unsecure, right? Like a device driver can do anything it wants, and if there's a bug in any one of the drivers, then the whole system is, uh, is compromised. And on the other hand, uh, we have applications which are, you know, relatively sort of isolated and constrained, but uh, but not very flexible. In fact, you know, if you run something like ps-x on your Linux machine, I don't know what the equivalent is on Windows. I'm sorry. Uh, then you will probably see that most processes end up running as root because it turns out that the sort of API that we give applications is just not flexible enough to accomplish a lot of the tasks that uh, that developers need to to accomplish. So one of the problems with exploring, I think, this kind of question in, uh, in, in, in operating systems research has been that the, the sort of target systems are very ossified, right? If, if I want to evaluate how well, you know, sort of a Linux or Windows replacement actually does in the wild, I'm really asking people to replace, you know, not only a particular operating system, but sort of a whole suite of tools built over decades, as well as sort of system administration experience. And, and also, these systems are basically very, very ossified. But microcontrollers are, are sort of a totally different beast. So microcontrollers are these very constrained, uh, limited resource computers that are in, are in all sorts of applications around us, like HVAC systems and security chips and drones and flight controllers and so forth. They typically have very, very limited uh, resources, in particular, very little memory. So 64 kilobytes is a, is a pretty, uh, pretty representative amount of RAM on these systems. 
And they don't have the same kinds of hardware security features that we're used to from sort of larger computers. So they typically don't have virtual memory in particular. And so as a result, they basically can't use systems like Linux. Uh, and instead, the people that build software for these things basically, you know, effectively are writing bare metal code, often using some sort of embedded framework. Uh, but even those are sort of highly modified for, uh, for the particular application. And the result is kind of monolithic code that, that embodies both the application and the drivers and the operating system. Um, and, uh, and we also don't have to deal with the sort of portability uh, that we might have in a larger system. So these are sort of very unossified systems. And at the same time, oh yeah, question in the back. Uh, this quick question says, is there a reason that the resource in these microcontroller uh, devices is so limited? Yeah. Uh, would, would, would there be much more resource available on these devices in the near future? That's an excellent question. So uh, basically, why the 64 kilobytes of RAM, and will that change, say, in, a, in five years or a decade? So I have th I've, um, two and a half answers to that. So the, 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 the sort of first is the, the two reasons, at least historically until today, uh, and including today, have been both power and security. So typically, often these microcontrollers are used in sort of power-constrained settings. and Roughly speaking, for SRAM and DRAM, there's a trade-off between power consumption uh, during sleep, during deep sleep, and the amount of RAM that you can retain. So the more RAM you want to retain, the higher the power consumption. Um, there's a chance that technologies like FRAM will change that. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it, but it could happen. Uh, the other reason is uh, sort of similar. It has to do with security. So if you want to harden uh, a piece of hardware against, <coughs> excuse me, against uh, basically things like power analysis, then um, effectively you have to reduce the size of the chip and be, be very careful about sort of the distances between components on the device. And so that ends up also constraining memory. You don't want to have caches, that sort of thing. Both of those things could change in five to 10 years. I think from my perspective, as, as I think I'll talk about, I'm mostly concerned with uh, being able to evaluate the kinds of techniques that we use. And so, you know, even if the system that we're going to end up that I'm going to end up talking about today is ends up being sort of useless in 10 years. That's okay as long as we've been able to use sort of those five, 10 years to evaluate some of the techniques. Although it's not clear that that that, that those constraints will go away. Anyway, this is a great question. So uh, we have these uh, software stacks and, and and hardware systems that basically don't provide any sort of isolation. But on the other hand, there's sort of new kinds of applications that demand this, uh, that demand uh, sort of isolation features. So things like USB authentication keys uh, typically run like multiple different, uh, different functions simultaneously. Uh, sensor networks are starting to be consolidated and multiple researchers might run the same experiments on the, or different experiments rather, simultaneously on the same network. And wearables like fitness devices, like fitness watches, uh, are even starting to support sort of third party applications. So taking just one of those examples and looking sort of deeper, let's look at these USB authentication keys. I'll use this as sort of a running example throughout the talk. So these uh, devices are actually pretty complicated systems. They typically run multiple independent applications at the same time. So they might have a couple uh, second fa factor authentication applications and often some sort of a encryption related application like maybe a GPG smart card. Um, and I think these exa are exactly the kinds of devices that maybe many, many of us would like to extend somehow. So you know, maybe Microsoft uses a different second factor authentication uh, than Stanford does. Or maybe it would make sense to add a password manager, maybe like a cryptocurrency wallet or something like that to these devices. But ultimately, the companies that make these devices sort of determined that the isolation boundaries between the components in the system just aren't strong enough to be able to justify allowing sort of third-party applications at all. Uh, and so the result is that you know, a handful of programmers that happen to work at the company that builds this device, uh, they control the entire software stack. And so this sort of mismatch between the hardware and software capabilities and the new kinds of applications that these uh, systems are being used for, I think is an opportunity to get some adoption for, uh, for a research system that improves the robustness of, uh, of the software in the system. Okay, so what would it look like if you know, we allow 20 million programmers to extend this, uh, extend this system somehow? And so you know, as I kind of alluded to, I think we, we know that we want some form of isolation. And so we can start to think about 
basically who writes the, the different components in, in, in the system. What's, you know, sort of what's the threat model for the system, if you will. So at the lowest level, we have uh, platform providers. These are basically the people that build the hardware. And they're going to have to be responsible for sort of the lowest level of software in the system. You know, basically the stuff that translates the particular hardware semantics, particular devices on the, on the board, for example, into, or on the chip, rather, into, uh, into something that the software can, that software can deal with. And I think that sort of on some level, fundamentally, they have to be totally trusted. Uh, but, you know, I think an important goal here is to make it possible to, um, to correctly extend the, this sort of trusted computing base. The reason is that you know my collaborators and I aren't going to be building the TCB for every possible system out there, and so it ought to be structured in such a way that you know it's at least you know reasonable for some person building a device to extend this system for their particular hardware in a way that doesn't totally break security guarantees. But then most of the sort of operating system services will be provided by other people, right? So you know things like device drivers for peripheral chips might be provided by the chip vendor or the open source community might collaborate on things like networking protocols and virtualization layers and timers and so forth. And so the platform provider can sort of select which operating system services to include in the hardware uh, or to include in their system. And so they have some chance to maybe audit these uh, components, but you know, we know that in practice auditing doesn't catch all bugs and in fact these particular kinds of components are typically huge sources of security vulnerabilities in systems, and so we need some way of protecting the kernel from at least safety violations in these components. And then finally, there's applications. These are the things that you know, most of these 20 million developers are going to actually be building. And they implement the sort of functionality that end users actually care about, like you know, an authentication application or a password manager or something like that. And you know, because there's so many developers and because we want the end user to be able to install whichever applications they might choose in the end, we have no way of, of reasoning about sort of who these developers are or what they might be building. And so we sort of need to model them as potentially malicious, right? These applications might try to do arbitrary things to subvert the system safety or reliability. Okay, so uh, three or so years ago, my collaborators at, uh, at Berkeley in Michigan and at Stanford uh, we have this weekly call where we, we were basically talking about this, this problem and these, uh, these ideas and this sort of way of thinking about uh, software for microcontrollers. And two of my colleagues at Berkeley, uh, Michael and Gabe, wanted to try out some of the, these ideas in an embedded systems class that they were teaching um, the next semester. And so they sort of went back to the operating systems literature and picked up the kind of design that we know from the literature to be you know, probably pretty good. Uh, which is effectively something like a, like a microkernel. And so they took the TinyOS, uh, sorry, they took TinyOS, which is one of these embedded systems frameworks that, that's out there. This is uh, from the research and is sort of particularly good at minimizing resource consumption. And they use that as a, as a sort of base to provide the, the, the minimal set of features that we need for a software system uh, on the particular hardware that they were using. But on top of that, they, uh, they basically built something similar to a microkernel. Now, because they, we don't have sort of hardware virtual memory, uh, they decided to use uh, the type system of a small embeddable language called Lua to uh, basically encapsulate sort of most of the operating system services as well as the application. Um, so they built this system. It worked uh, pretty well. I can tell you after spending about a year writing TinyOS code that being able to write you know, in a sort of normal language like Lua was, one, it was wonderful. Michael and Gabe ported a bunch of applications they had for their sensor network research to the system. Those all worked, you know, just fine. But when they, oh yeah, Sid. So, are you saying that they spent the work in preparation for the class to build these modules um, in a kind of microphone architecture? So these things are running in. In, in something like Lua Threads. Oh, in Lua Threads. Yeah. Compatible, and that works. I say, so you can program them in Lua Threads. Yes. Yeah. Just a given that you can program in Lua Threads. And it works on TinyOS? Well, it, wasn't, it was, took them about a month of, uh, of engineering. But roughly speaking, they ported the Lua runtime to, okay, uh, to run on top of. To do that work. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's like a project called eLua that did some of the work. Yeah. It was one of these, you know, they were doing it for a class in a month. So it was a little bit, um, it had to be a little bit hacky. But, but roughly speaking, yeah, they sort of did the work to port Lua to run on top of the TinyOS uh, interfaces. Yeah. 
Uh, and then the idea is was that they built some of these services, but sort of the class would end up building uh, yeah. most of them and the applications exactly. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, right, so this worked great basically as long as the people who were writing applications and services were people who also understood at a pretty deep level sort of how the system worked. But once they gave it to the class, it didn't work quite as well. And what they found is that the students' programs just kept running out of memory and crashing the whole system. Um, I think, you know, Michael and Gabe actually sort of anticipated this ahead of time. You know, Lua is garbage collected and it's, it's not as, uh, and they sort of know from their experience that memory consumption is a particularly important thing to control in an embedded system. Um, but this was the experience that they had, and I think this actually ended up being a really useful experience because it reinforced that with these low memory systems, with 64 kilobytes of RAM, that any sort of dynamic heap allocation is, is a threat to system stability and, and one that needs to be somehow controlled. Uh, and Garbage collection in particular sort of makes these kinds of shortages more difficult because they're unpredictable. We don't know ahead of time sort of when a piece of memory is going to be freed. And in, in, in particular, in the way that you end up programming these kinds of systems, because it's so tempting to sort of share pointers, share memory across different components, even if you know sort of when garbage collection is going to happen, uh, you may not be able to reclaim memory from a component that's over allocated because other components in the system might be pointing to sort of the memory that it allocated. And so we're sort of missing two pieces of important information from the developer. We don't know who to charge for a particular memory allocation, and we don't know ahead of time when it might be safe to free a particular piece of allocated memory. Okay, so you know, because we don't have virtual memory, this is why we went with a type-safe system, or why Michael and Gabe went with a type-safe language like Lua in the first place. Uh, and that turned out to not work quite as well. But you know, we have new kinds of isolation tools. So while virtual memory doesn't exist, uh, relatively newer Cortex M microcontrollers from ARM have a different kind of hardware protection called the memory protection unit, which you know, while it doesn't provide uh, virtual memory, does provide sort of fine-grained protection bits for a, a small number of, uh, of memory region in, regions in a flat address space. And so maybe we can use the memory protection unit to isolate process-like components in the system uh, for, for these applications. And while a garbage-collected language like Lua seems I mean, maybe not the most appropriate, we have new kinds of type-safe languages like Rust, which is a non-garbage-collected type-safe uh, language. And so maybe we can use the type system to prevent at least safety violations in the kernel, but at very low sort of resource and memory overhead. And so we built talk sort of around these observations. Um, so we have uh, processes where we use the MPU, the hardware, to, uh, to protect basically application code. And this abstraction called capsules in the kernel uh, that uh, are written in Rust, and the kernel provides a type-safe API for, for building them. And then finally, there's a memory management mechanism called grants to basically bridge the gap between these very dynamic processes and sort of static capsules. I'll talk about all three of them. Yeah, question. So I think I'm missing a little bit. Um, so you're using the memory protection unit to isolate processes. Right? Yeah. But um, why is that required when you have a type safe language? Ah, uh, good question. So it, it, could be, um, it could be totally possible to... Uh, to use Rust for uh, applications as well. But because we have the hardware, we can, we can get sort of stronger guarantees, for example, the fact that they're checked at runtime. But also, it just means that people can write code uh, in whatever language they want. And in fact, most of the code that people write for applications on talk is in, is in C, because sensor network people just happen to prefer or be used to C. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you, you couldn't have to. And in fact, if we... We can chat at some point. I think that there's some significant performance improvements that you could get if you, uh, if you, if you, if you use sort of a unified language for both. Okay, so you know, I'll talk about these two isolation mechanisms separately because they're, they're quite different. So processes are just standalone executables like in other systems that can be written in any language. Typically in talk, they're written in C at the moment. Um, and their isolation is enforced by the hardware at runtime. The result of this is that they have relatively high overhead. But they're totally untrusted, and so we can use them to isolate these potentially malicious applications. Um, capsules, on the other hand, are just Rust code that are linked into the kernel, uh, 
and they're isolated using the type system at compile time. And so they have significantly lower overhead, both in terms of memory and performance, than uh, processes. Um, but they, uh, they need to be trusted for sort of the liveness of the system. That's an architectural uh, decision, basically. But they're not trusted for safety. So you know, a sensor driver somewhere over here in the system is you know, isolated to not be able to read like an encryption key from some other place in the system. And so we can use them for sort of the majority of extensibility in the system for things like device drivers and protocols and timers and so forth. OK, so processes, as I said, are similar to processes in, processes, sorry, in other systems. They're isolated by the hardware. Um, and uh, basically, each process has its own dedicated memory region that it can use for its stack uh, to save state when they're context switched, as well as you know, static variables. And if it wants, uh, then a dynamically allocated heap. Uh, they're run dynamically, so we don't know ahead of time which processes are going to run in the system. And they could be replaced at runtime as well. And they're scheduled preemptively, which means that it's safe for them to run sort of expensive computations or spin in a while one loop or something like that. And they communicate just using system calls and IPC. And so the, the result is that they have relatively uh, high overhead. So each process needs its own dedicated memory region, at least for a stack so that we can sort of preemptively schedule them. And so that takes up some sort of fixed cost for each process. And to do anything in the system outside of just computing uh, with, with, uh, within the, the process, they need to context switch. And that's expensive. So for some kinds of operations, uh, using a process is just a non-starter. If I want to, for example, toggle a pin on the chip very quickly so that I can, say, simulate a USB bus or something like that, then the context switch overhead is just, uh, is just too large. And I, I, you know, I won't be able to use a process there. But for other kinds of operations, like if I'm sending a large buffer over a serial bus, for example, then you know, sending that buffer is going to take, I don't know, 11 milliseconds or so. And so what's another 100 microseconds to configure the bus and, and initiate the transaction? OK, but for these very sort of uh, low latency operations um, and performance sensitive operations, we have capsules. So a capsule is basically just a Rust module, some data structures and their associated methods, maybe some, uh, some global variables. And when, when we compile a system composed of capsules, they run in a sing, single-threaded event loop model. And capsules only have access to asynchronous I.O. So they are cooperatively scheduled, but they can't block each other, at least not on, uh, on I.O., just because they don't have access to blocking I.O. operations. And they share a single stack, and they don't have access to a heap. So we get sort of some of the uh, reliability benefits that we want from an embedded system. And finally, they communicate just using references and method calls in the normal Rust language. And the upshot here is that these things can often be inlined by the compiler. And so when we compile a system composed of these capsules, the hope is to get uh, something that sort of has the same kinds of overheads as a monolithic kernel that may have been written in something like C. And so you know, to get at this, uh, at this question, we took two different extreme applications. One of them is the kind of embedded system hello world. It's a blink application, just blinks an LED periodically. And the sec second application is a more fully featured sort of sensor network style application that you know, gathers a bunch of sensors periodically and sends, them, sends those readings over the network. And then we built those applications in, uh, in, a, in using just the talk kernel, so just capsules, no processes as well as using TinyOS, which is that uh, system from the research from before. Yes, Sid? Did you say the capsules actually share a single stack? Yes, so correct. they're able to just you know, share variables? Uh, yeah, you could but share variables just... otherwise. Uh, the single stack is important because uh, they basically can't be preemptively scheduled. I see. How would yeah. you share variables otherwise without? Well, they could be global variables, or they could be allocated. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean they, would, they might have to be allocated on the heap. Right. Which we don't have. Yeah. Don't yeah. That, right? okay. yeah, yeah. Does your threat model for capsules is specifically compile time only? Right? You don't allow that's correct. Um, runtime injection of those threat um, That's correct. It's in um, the. I, I don't know that the threat model would preclude that necessarily. Like you can imagine, if you if you had some way of having provenance about who compiled the the code, that would be fine. It is very important from a performance perspective because uh, I won't show this, but um, but so much of the, uh, of the relatively low overhead that we get is basically thanks to the inliner. Um, 
Okay, so we, so we built these two applications using just a talk kernel as well as in TinyOS. And then we compared the overhead in terms of the code size, that's ROM, and the, the memory consumption. Um, so, you know, we can see that for a small application like Blink, uh, talk uses a little bit less code than TinyOS and, you know, a bit more memory. Um, that kind of makes sense because TinyOS is actually particularly good at sort of eliminating unused um, things like memory buffers. And it also makes an explicit trade-off between sort of using a bit less memory in exchange for, uh, for more code. Um, but once we go to a sort of a more fully featured application that uses more components, then you know, this difference is kind of in the noise. So it's roughly what we would hope for. But despite this relatively low overhead, we can actually achieve fairly uh, interesting sort of isolation semantics. So this, is, uh, this code is taken from the implementation in talk for uh, the DMA controller on one of the platforms that we support. And the goal of this, uh, of this capsule, of this DMA channel uh, capsule, is to take the hardware, the DMA hardware, which basically lets you set a base pointer and length, and uh, to ask the hardware to transfer from the memory, transfer that buffer basically from the memory bus to some communication uh, controller, or vice versa. So take that functionality and expose it to the rest of the kernel, to other capsules. But of course, we don't want to expose that interface directly because that would effectively allow you know, some capsule to read and write arbit to arbitrary memory if they just could directly write the, the length and base pointer. And so instead, it makes these variables, these uh, fields rather, private. We can tell that they're private because they don't have a pub keyword in front of them. And exposes a method instead, the send buffer method, which doesn't take the length and base pointer, but takes uh, what's called a Rust slice, which is um, basically a bounds checked array. And so just using this uh, sort of this, the type of this, uh, of this method, we're actually getting a lot of information from the developer that we can use. So first of all, uh, because it's in a bounds checked array, uh, and because the Rust type system sort of guarantees that there's no way for me to just create one of these out of thin air, I know in the implementation of this function that you know, the caller must have access to this memory. And so you'll notice that there's no checks on how long the buffer is or where the base uh, the base pointer might reside because I just sort of know a priori that this thing is valid. Um, similarly, this tick static is uh, what Rust calls a lifetime, and it basically um, asserts sort of when uh, a value might be deallocated in the future. Tick static means it never gets deallocated. And so this tells me that I know that there's no way for the, this, this value, the, the, the memory associated with this, with this variable, there's no way for it to be deallocated before the hardware uh, completes its operation, right? Because it, it lives forever. Um, okay, and so I think this is kind of a good example of getting the, the developer to express exactly what they mean. Uh, and if we can do that, then we can enforce pretty rich policies without really constraining the developer almost at all, uh, right? They, you know, uh, uh, you know the, 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 I think the only sort of reasonable operation to do here is is one where uh, where I'm passing in a buffer that I actually, I actually have access to. Um, okay. So I've kind of talked about these two different worlds. We have these capsules, which are static. They don't have access to any sort of dynamic allocation except for the stack, and we know exactly which ones will run ahead of time. And on the other hand, we have these processes, which are in some sense totally dynamic. They can do sort of whatever they want at runtime, at least within their own memory space, and we don't even know which ones are going to run ahead of time. And so... Um, you know, how do these two things, how do these two worlds interact? In particular, you know, how does the kernel, how do capsules in the kernel allocate resources for requests from processes that it doesn't know, that they don't know about ahead of time? So to ground that question, let's just look at a particular example. So this is a, uh, this, uh, this diagram is showing a particular capsule, a software timer, which is going to use a single hardware alarm, an alarm in the hardware, to expose a bunch of software timers to processes. It's sort of a virtualization layer in some sense for the alarm. And so the, at, the, at a high level, you know, this capsule, we know that it exists ahead of time at compile time, but this capsule doesn't know if there's going to be one process in the system or multiple processes, or if only one process will ask for uh, a timer, or if multiple will, or if one process will ask for a bunch of timers and others won't. And so the question is, you know, where does this capsule allocate slots for these timer requests? So one option would be to just statically allocate a bunch of uh, a fixed number of uh, of slots for timer states. 
And so this is what typically embedded systems do when there aren't these dynamic processes. But when we have dynamic processes, you know, this sort of runs into two problems. The first is that if we don't use up all of our timer slot slots, then we've sort of wasted this precious memory that we could use elsewhere in the system. And once we do use up all the slots, well, then the next request that comes in, the capsule won't be able to service, and we'll have to block the process, which would be weird for a timer, or, or, or kill it, or something like that. And so using strictly static allocation sort of forces us to trade off the maximum amount of concurrency that we have in the system and, uh, and memory efficiency. Uh, potentially a more intuitive approach, at least from a system design perspective, might be to just dynamically allocate from a global heap. So in this case, whenever a process requests, requests a timer, we'll just allocate a slot from some global kernel heap. And of course, other drivers will do the same thing. But eventually, we might run out of memory again. And so, you know, again, we'll have to either, we might have to sort of kill the process that made the request. But even worse, we may have to kill a process that's making requests from drivers that are not hungry at all and even doesn't talk to the, to the, to the timer driver. Um, and so this can sort of lead to these unpredictable shortages that we had back in that system that Mike and Gabe wrote in Lua, where basically one process's demands are affecting other processes' ability to, uh, to, to also uh, request resources from the system. So just sort of what's happening here is that we've constructed this nice world where processes each have their own isolated memory regions and they sort of operate independently. And then we've reintroduced this shared resource that they can exhaust from each other. And again, we're kind of missing exactly these two important questions that we needed to ask from the developer. In particular, who should be charged for these memory allocations in the kernel? And when might it be safe to, to free, those, uh, free those values? And so in, in talk, we use a mechanism called grants to, to address this problem. Grants are basically per process kernel heaps. So each process has its own memory region where it stores its stack and data section and maybe a heap if it wants to. And we use also part of that memory region to, um, to store a dynamically sized, what we call a grant section. It was basically a part of the memory region that the process doesn't have access to and is used to store kernel specific variables for that process. So the idea is that you know, one process can't affect another process's ability to, uh, to request resources because you know, if one grant section sort of overruns, uh, overruns its size and we have to kill the process, the rest of the system could just keep on going. Um, and importantly, we need to be able to free all of those resources for a process as soon as a process dies. So let's see, those, see sorry, how this works in our example. This time when a process asks for a timer, then the timer driver is going to just allocate a new grant in the process's grant section. And if a process asks for more than one timer, we'll just allocate multiple grants in that same grant section. And eventually, a process might ask for too many resources, and we may have to kill it. But the rest of the system can sort of just keep on going. Yeah, question. So this is since allocating effectively kernel memory and user processes. Is this protected by the MCU? Yeah, yeah. So um, sorry if I didn't make that clear. Uh, let me just go back one slide. So, so this uh, section is basically protected by the MPU to prevent accesses from the process. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Sid. Why is it poor? Could it be the case that, they, that you know, the behavior of one of the processes could affect uh, another one's ability? Can you show me the, the diagram? On, so, so I understand that you've limited. Okay, you've taken away control from the process. Bounded the amount of space that they can use for this grant stuff. Effectively, yeah. Um, before, what was going on? That was not. I mean, they were basically the drivers were basically allocating from some shared heap. I see. So they're all they're all in the same location. And I guess one thing I didn't mention is that we don't really know anything about the the way that these allocations are used. They're just used normally in the kernel. So I might have like shared data structures across the drivers, or maybe within the drivers across processes, which will come into play in a second. Okay. Uh, so let's go back, back to where you were. Oh, so um, right. So grants sort of give us hopefully the best of both worlds. They give us the sort of safety and reliability of static allocation with the memory efficiency of dynamic allocation. And importantly, we want to be able to reclaim all of the memory from a process that we just killed immediately so that we can just respawn the process or run another one or something like that. Um, but to do this, it's really important to make sure that there's no dangling pointers from somewhere in the kernel into this now invalid grant section from the process. Um, 
And uh, OK, so one way you might imagine doing this is when a process dies, basically ask each one of the capsules to dereference any sort of outstanding references ahead to the grant section. But remember, we don't expect these drivers to be bug free. And this is a particular kind of bug where if a capsule sort of fails to, to dereference some, uh, some, some, val some uh, variable to this old grant section, then you know, we have a dangling pointer that could potentially totally subvert the, this nice type safety that we got. Um, and so grants sort of leverage the type system to help ensure this property that we care about. In particular, capsules don't actually get, uh, ever get to have direct references to, uh, to, gr to grant allocated memory. And instead, they have uh, uh, something that's sort of an abstract grant of a particular type that they can enter to get access to temporarily to the, to the grant allocated memory. And they enter it by pass passing, sorry, an opaque process ID into the enter method. And the enter method checks to see that the process is still alive. And only if the process is still alive does it execute some closure that the capsule passed into the enter method. And so in here, this timer variable is the only thing that's the actual reference to the, um, to the actually granted memory. Now, of course, it's important that this timer, timer variable can't escape the closure, because otherwise, again, we've sort of broken this guarantee that we wanted that the capsule never has access to the grant memory directly, at least in the long term. And so here we use a property of the Rust type system called lifetimes, which I mentioned earlier, that basically lets us bound the validity of a particular variable. And so in this case, the timer variable is only valid within the scope of this closure. So if you, uh, the kind of person that likes types, this, uh, the type signature of enter here, the important bits are that this tick A lifetime uh, has no relationship to this existential tick B lifetime on the closure. Yeah, Sid. So that, those bars on the left and right of timer, is that actual syntax? Yeah, this is the syntax for a closure in Rust. Basically, the bars are, um, this is where you put the arguments into the closure. Okay. Yeah, this so would what be. What do you think the process dies while this is occurring? Sorry, could you? You, said you mentioned that ah. the process being alive is important during, <clears throat> during the lifetime of that method, right? Good question. So, um, so, uh, so the kernel has always has priority. Yeah, so this is an important sort of co design between the, the use of language constructs and the system design. So, in particular, in this case, the kernel is always, ha always has higher priority over processes. And we only ever sort of decide to kill a process or not, you know, at the very top level in the process scheduler, which is sort of up stack always from uh, from these closures. Exactly. This is code running inside of the timer capsule. So exactly. Correct. Correct. Okay. So you know, with this mechanism and the and the uh, and the architecture of the system, we you know kind of have this nice uh, these nice dynamic allocations that are still reliable, but it's not totally free. In particular, we, uh, you know, an intuitive way to design this timer driver is to effectively store some sorted data structure to keep track of all the outstanding timers, something like a, a priority heap or just a, a sorted linked list or something like that. But we can't do that because you know, the capsule has no notion of when one of these uh, grants sort of might go away. And if one of the processes dies, then it, you know, it might lose sort of the pointers to the rest of the data structure. And so instead, we have to basically separate these data structures per process. So each, uh, so the capsule might store sort of an arbitrarily complex data structure for each process, but sort of never the two shall meet. Um, yeah. The kernel is single threaded. Yeah, yeah. And then the processes are uh, concurrent. Yeah. Um, and so this means that whenever an, a hardware event comes in. We have to iterate through effectively all the processes that may have allocated a timer, may have requested a timer, and so that looks something like this. Um, and asymptotically, it's kind of a bummer. It means that the more processes we have, you know, the more we'll have to iterate. It's it's sort of a linear. Um, the the bright side is that you know these systems are very limited in memory. That's kind of the whole point, and so we can only fit so many processes and practice on them. And so you know, I took uh, as many processes as I could fit. Request, uh, requesting timers, at least on one of the systems. And you know, the overhead for iterating through all processes when an event comes in is sort of significantly lower than the absolute finest granularity alarm that we can configure for the system. Um, so the idea is that hopefully this works out in practice, at least. Um, OK, I don't unfortunately have enough time to go through some of the details of using Rust in a system like this, but I'm happy to either go back to this in questions or talk about it offline. Um, and instead, 
uh, I want to talk about uh, evaluating end-to-end, -end, right? So I talked about sort of a, a system that we built and what the uh, sort of technical trade-offs are, but I haven't really gotten at whether the system is usable at all or whether it actually is able to satisfy sort of security guarantees. And so, you know, over the past few years, we've been uh, evaluating this in practice in a number of different ways. So there's some research groups that are using Talk primarily to build sensor networks. We've been running these half-day tutorials at conferences where we get to have one-on-one -on -one experience with people sort of learning to build capsules and processes for the first time. There's a growing open source community, including a few sort of industrial adopters of Talk. And uh, my co-advisor, Phil Levis, has been using Talk to, to uh, teach an embedded systems class, much like the one that Mike and Gabe taught at Berkeley. So just a few examples of sort of the uh, deployed use cases that we, we can evaluate with. So in some sense, the sort of driving application for Talk was this uh, project by some of my collaborators called Signpost. Signpost is a modular city scale sensing network. The, basically what that means is that there's a bunch of these hardware platforms deployed all around the Berkeley campus. And each one of them has a solar panel for energy and a LoRa modem for network communication and some storage. But it also has eight slots where other people can build sensing modules with a microcontroller and a bunch of sensors and sort of stick them into this particular form factor and leverage the shared power and networking infrastructure. Can you just like walk up and stick it in? Well, you have to ask permission. <laughs> uh, although I think in the vision, maybe in theory, there's not a problem for that except for you know, the administrative uh, burdens of, uh, of, of uh, sharing this. Um, but yeah, roughly speaking, it's just like it just plug and play. So you could unscrew these uh, these glass boxes and take out a module. I wish I had known about it. Yeah. Um, and then you know researchers can build uh, a variety of applications for each of the existing deployed sensors. There's a startup called Helium, which is basically one of these sort of end-to-end -end IoT solutions. Uh, but one of the components of their offering is this programmable module. The module has uh, long-range radio as well as an authentication chip on board uh, that's used to sort of uh, you know, make it relatively easy to communicate with their particular cloud. And the micro microcontroller on board of this module runs both the sort of helium-sensitive code that's authenticating with the cloud and, and doing communication and software updates and so forth, as well as you know, applications written by, the, by Helium's customers. So, customer will stick this module on an actual sort of product that they're building, maybe for building automation or something like that. Uh, and it's important for this application not to uh, be able to uh, inadvertently, hopefully in this case, basically subvert the sort of Helium code, because that means that the Helium code won't be able to do software updates, and now this product is totally, totally bunk. So interestingly, uh, Helium actually used a very, originally a very similar system to what Mike and Gabe built, uh, again using Lua. And they ran into very similar problems. So their customers kept running out of memory. They had to upgrade the chips to relatively high power, sort of larger memory chips. And still, like their customers' uh, applications kept crashing. And so uh, about a year ago, they attended one of the workshops that we were running, at, in this case, at RustConf. And uh, the next version of the module that they'll release in the next month or so is going to be uh, running talk. And then finally, I spent a summer as an intern on the Google Titan team, basically porting talk to this Titan chip that Google builds. Uh, Titan is basically a security-hardened microcontroller. And they use it internally for all sorts of things, like server root of trust and for uh, things like these authentication devices. Um, and the kind of problem that they're trying to solve with systems like talk is that at the moment, there's basically a handful of security and microcontroller experts that have to audit sort of every line of code that anyone might want to run on one of these, one of these devices. Um, and so that's obviously a huge impediment internally for other people inside the company sort of prototyping or, or deploying new kinds of applications. OK, so using this experience uh, with actually deployed system as well as uh, you know, the classes and, and workshops, we're able to start sort of answering some end-to-end -end security questions. So first, you know, we have this threat model with platform providers and operating system services and applications, but does it actually fit uh, any real-world scenarios that, that people care about. So, you know, one thing we can do is sort of map the requirements of the deployed applications uh, onto the threat model and see if it fits. Uh, and I think it does. So on some, something like Signpost, the applications map to the things that researchers, that sensor network researchers, will, uh, will write. 
um, right? Because there might be multiple running on the same module, and they need to not be able to totally interfere with each other. Um, capsules might be written as uh, by sort of module builders to interface with particularly interesting kinds of sensors. And the platform is basically written by trusted people like the signpost authors and me, because I, I sometimes help out. Um, similarly for Helium, there's the sort of customers which you know, are maybe not malicious per se, but, but a bug in, in customer code could lead to fairly sort of catastrophic uh, problems in the system. But then capsules are sort of written by a combination of the community for particular sensors maybe and Helium for their particular uh, module. And the platform itself is, of course, controlled by Helium. Okay, secondly, is it possible for system builders to extend this trusted computing base, this platform code, uh, safely? So, you know, one thing to look at is sort of what kinds of things does the talk design and choice of language in this case, what kinds of problems does it rule out by design? Um, so, you know, a common bug in kernels is that uh, people fail to properly synchronize shared data structures between the interrupt context and the main thread. Well, talk is single-threaded in the kernel, so this just kind of can't happen by construction. Uh, similar, or another problem is sort of incorrectly using user pointers where uh, kernel buffers are expected. And so in talk, we get to use the type system to basically wrap user pointers coming in from processes in such a way that they just can't be used by, uh, by, by kernel structures. And things like use after free, we sort of uh, get just by using a type-safe language like Rust, and I suppose using it correctly. So we can look at sort of what the split of code is in deployed systems that use talk. Uh, so these are just two example modules that are deployed on Signpost. And the breakdown of where code uh, ends up living in, in sort of each of the kinds of components. So the, there's you know, some amount of sort of trusted platform code. But the majority of code is in one of these two isolated uh, mechanisms, either capsules or processes. And in fact, the plurality is in these sort of totally untrusted, potentially malicious processes. Yeah. So one thing that wasn't clear to me, the capsules link directly against the platform, the library. Yes. Is the, what do the processes, do they also link? Do they have some sort of an API, API they use? Yeah, they, they, exactly. They talk over a system call API, okay. and they're, they're linked totally separately and loaded okay. as binary separately, yeah. So they have a fairly stable interface then for those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In so, fact, we just tagged the sort of 1.0 process uh, interface. So then one question about the capsules in the the flip side of having the extensibility is always the maintainability. Have you, that every time you change, you, if you don't have a you know like a kernel API, ABI kind of thing between yeah. those, you have to keep moving them in sync. And have you found that as a problem that with the gap skills at all? Um, so we, um, yeah, there's kind of two. You can look at talk as two different systems. One is the core design, and the other is you know what actually ends up living in the main repository. Um, kind of talk as a design, and maybe the core components are m slightly slightly more extensible than the system that we actually have, where the system we actually have defines some set of uh, of interfaces inside the kernel as well. Um, actually, I'm actually still very uh, unsure if those are the right interfaces, uh, but I think that it, it exactly gets at that problem. Yeah. So it's kind of like the FreeBSD core process based kind of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I don't have an answer to that yet, but I, I agree. That's that's. Uh, Again, like one of these trade-offs showing up. Um, OK. Uh, uh, maybe slightly more extreme example is with the embedded systems class that, uh, that Phil ran. So, um, so the TA that uh, worked on that class ported talk to a totally new platform, the Teensy. Um, and the idea with the class was that they were end up, ended up building basically these programmable colorful bike wheels, presumably to match uh, my advisor's hair. And, uh, and here, again, the, the sort of porting to a new chip required a fair amount of, uh, of effort. But using a relatively sort of a newer mechanism from what was available when uh, the signpost folks were building signpost to sort of uh, um, isolate uh, uh, the, or concentrate, rather, the amount of sort of actual unsafe code that's required, you know, Shane, the TA, was able to do it in about 170 lines of code. So that's relatively little amount of code that you really need to very carefully audit to, uh, to be sure that you're, that you're getting at least baseline guarantees. Um, OK, and then finally, 
you know, is it possible to build applications? Can developers actually use the system? Uh, this is difficult to evaluate quantitatively, I think, but the, in some sense, like, the proof is in the pudding. There's deployed applications out there. So we can at least look at whether the API and the system de design sort of satisfies the kinds of requirements that these applications care about. So a uh, typical requirement is energy consumption. And so in the signpost paper that's going to be published soon, uh, which I had nothing to do with, the authors sort of looked at where energy ends up going in the system. And so as we would hope, you know, some of the, uh, some of the energy goes to actual processing. Presumably some of it goes to the overhead of processes in particular. But the vast majority of energy is consumed by sensors. And in fact, the chip spends most of its time sort of in, in a deep sleep state. Um, OK, so talk is kind of an ongoing piece of work. And we're using it as a platform to explore other kinds of questions, particularly related to sort of what does it look like to build a system in this, an embedded system, rather, in this world where we have dynamic applications that we don't know about ahead of time. So one particular problem that we're looking at, uh, my colleague Holly at Stanford is sort of leading this effort, is understanding how to, uh, how to manage energy efficiently uh, in this world. So these microcontrollers typically have lots of choices of clocks that you can use, and they can run at all different frequencies. And there's all sorts of constraints about sort of which uh, controllers can run with which clocks at which frequencies. And typically, you would just make some sort of static uh, decision about the path that the program is going to take in terms of choosing clocks and frequencies. But we can't do that if we, have, if we don't know the workload ahead of time. So the idea is to hide the clock choices from the application and sort of do this uh, just in the, in the kernel in a platform-specific way. But of course, we don't know a priori if it's possible for people to build applications efficiently using this. So you know, we can use the talk user base to evaluate this, uh, this question. Um, OK, so I think I don't have a ton of time to go over the other two systems. So I'll just very briefly sort of uh, hit the highlights. So Hales is this web platform that I, I worked on uh, with colleagues early in my PhD. The basic idea was to solve this problem that you know, if you're building a Facebook uh, application, you, you don't get access to most of the data because, well, you, you can't be trusted not to, not to leak sort of sensitive user data. So the high level idea was to use decentralized information flow control to control where data can end up rather than uh, who can have access to which code can have access to it. But the typical problem with DIFC systems is that it's very difficult, it turns out, to specify policies and, and write applications for them. Um, and so our, our insight was that if you can sort of get the people, if you can allow the people that are writing the data model uh, for, the, for, for, the, uh, for data in the system to write policies alongside that data, that's both sort of the right place to do it because they have a lot of insight about you know, what the policy should be. And it allows the rest of the system to sort of in, enforce policies mandatorily. Um, and another system is Beetle, which tried to address a problem where you know, it turns out that uh, low power wireless peripherals like BLE devices uh, don't have any way of uh, internally of sort of managing multiple users of the same device. So that means that applications basically, uh, you can only have one application using a device at a time. Um, so the insight is that if you can figure out where the sort of application level transaction begins and ends, that's enough to multiplex the device safely without necessarily having a sort of very high level understanding of what exactly the device is trying to do. And so we use that to build a, a system for the gateway. Um, OK, and then finally, I'm sort of very interested in exploring these kinds of questions in the future as well. Uh, so you know, I think the Internet of Things is, uh, is sort of a wide open problem and has lots of uh, places to explore this. And in particular, the sort of uh, um, Momentum with talk, I think, is, is, is exciting and is showing us that this is a space where developers might actually at least try out research systems. But I'm also interested in, in, in other, uh, other arenas. So you know, the idea that programmable hardware like FPGAs is showing up on all sorts of computers all the way from edge devices to, to servers uh, sort of begs the question, what does it look like for an application developer to, to actually leverage this programmable hardware? And what are the systems trade-offs in terms of scheduling and, and, and uh, safety if we're multiplexing them? And then you know, maybe most exciting to me right now is this notion of serverless computing, which is basically programmers, cloud programmers, decomposing their code into these small, sort of short-lived, uh, almost pure functional style programs that, importantly, I think, are almost entirely disconnected from the fact that under the hood there's Windows or, or Linux running them. And so I think that this is an avenue where we can start exploring all of these sort of cloud OS questions that the systems community sort of started asking 10 years ago, but ultimately sort of ran into the wall of, uh, of not being able to evaluate them. <laughs>
Okay, so you know, at a high level, I'm an operating systems researcher, and I, I'm interested in sort of maximizing the number of developers that can extend and work on a system. Um, and this trade-off between the flexibility of the programmer and security is sort of a long-standing problem, but I actually think that there's a lot of opportunity to sort of start breaking through and, and reducing that trade-off, both because we have opportunities to deploy and evaluate research systems, and also because we have new kinds of tools like programming languages and hardware features that can allow us to do that. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Have you thought about any learnings from this that can be applied in an incremental fashion to existing operating systems? Oh, that's an excellent question. Have you uh, thought about learnings that you can apply from this to existing operating systems in an incremental fashion? Yeah. So what? What? Yeah. How we could use uh, the some of the techniques maybe that we learned from talk. Um, to incrementally improve the security or extensibility of other systems. Um, uh, not, not deeply yet. I think that the, um, the model of, uh, of, uh, of using the type system could be applied to sort of individual subsystems in an existing sort of larger monolithic kernel. And I think maybe the, the most important lesson is that it can be quite important and useful to uh, control uh, control dynamic memory allocation inside the system, and that that's sort of feasible, at least with, with language features. I thought the grant system was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that might be something that you could... Yeah, you could imagine modifying kernels to impose a grant interface. Yeah. And then... Um, it's, oh, we need an extra system call there. Yeah, incrementally might be hard, but what's interesting um, is if you also apply that to some of the singularity research groups, which later became Midori, which later became... Wave front inside WDG, which is internal, uh, but to use their software isolator processes right. mechanism right. right on top of this, because now you're running everything in ring zero using the MCU just for sort of yeah. the bare bones of memory management, and you suddenly have a pretty interesting pure container approach to dealing with this sort of kernel process isolation. Yeah, I agree. The, the, I think one of the main challenges of using the grant mechanism is it's not clear if that uh, lack of scalability in grants would end up being a problem for uh, for a larger system. We get away because like, you know, you can only fit 16 processes or something, so no big deal. But I I, I don't yet know how bad it, how bad it would be for, you know, a larger system. Okay, sorry for running over. Yeah. Thanks, thanks on this Thank end. you.